Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Manga Storian. My name is Benny, I go by Comic Storian, I go by Benny, I go by Manga Storian. It's whatever you feel like calling me. And I decided to make a channel in which I just talk about the manga that I'm reading so that I can find a fun community to talk about it with. Today we're going to be covering chapters 842 to about 857 in my attempt to make sure we never miss a weekly One Piece episode, but I can read other manga at the same time. But honestly, I feel like this is the way to go because I have so many more notes about what's going on by having it condensed down. I feel like trying to cover 30 to 50 chapters in a sitting, I just couldn't write enough notes to talk about it all in depth. But by doing 15 or so chapters, I can have a lot of notes for a lot of the things that have basically happened. All right, so for this particular episode, just to remember, I'm reading the manga, I'm not watching the anime, which means that pronunciations might be off, as I've heard no one say these words, and I might not have certain pieces of filler or fluff that are in the anime, which may or may not add context. So, when we last left off, we were fighting against Master Cracker, I believe, and, and Luffy was basically eating all of the Biscuit Soldiers, only to turn into Super Bouncy Boy again, or Gear 4, but with all of the food in him, he became Super Tank, which, cool, nice little spin on it, but it's not going to be something he uses normally, because unless there's a conveniently Biscuit-based monsters everywhere he goes. But that was pretty cool, and he used that to finally beat Master Cracker. I don't really have much to say about the Master Cracker fight, other than Super Tank Man or whatever he ended up calling it was re relatively cool. But overall, I was just happy that we got to move forward because the next big fight under our belt is the Sanji versus Luffy fight. So what happens is Luffy and Nami are able to get away from the forest. I forget the name of what the forest is, but they get away from that forest. Chopper and Carrot are in the mirror world or so at the moment. Or maybe they're going to be in the mirror world. It doesn't matter. They're going to get captured. But they're not with Luffy and uh, Nami at the moment. Luffy and Nami run out and they run into the carriage that is bringing Sanji and his brothers and his sister to their next location. Sanji's aware that if he does anything against what Big Mom wants, which is him getting married to Pudding that basically it's going to cause a problem for his entire family. So Sanji is aware that if he just leaves the wedding as is and takes off, what's going to basically happen is his family, well, his real family, the Straw Hats, are going to be threatened by his father in the entire empire that he's a part of. Also, he's going to be on the bad side of Big Mom. So he's pretty much accepted the fact that he has to just be married to Pudding he has to go through with this wedding and he's going to do it so that everyone is safe and that he's going to save everyone. Really showing Sanji's character where he's willing to basically put up with, it, what, with what he considers to be his own personal hell just so that his friends at the Barati and his straw hat friends and everyone can be safe and have no threats going up against them. Cool. I like that idea. But of course, Luffy isn't on board with that idea. Luffy's answer is we can work together and figure this out. He doesn't know the situation Sanji is in. He doesn't know about the bracelets that are going to blow up Sanji's hands. He doesn't know about the entire thing where they've threatened the Barati and everyone else that Sanji knows can't defend themselves. So he's basically telling Sanji to come with him and Sanji and Luffy get into a huge fight. Now, huge is a bit of an understatement. So this was kind of hyped up in the manga. And according to Kevin, the guy who does these editing here, he's like, it was like really big. It was, it was being hyped a lot for the anime and stuff like that when that was going on. And so I was kind of like, okay, so this is going to be a big deal. It really wasn't. I think it was like two chapters, maybe three. And Luffy was already weak because he just ran through all of that and just digested all the biscuits. So he was already pretty beat up from Master Cracker. He also refused to fight against Sanji. And Sanji kind of refused to truly fight Luffy. So the Sanji versus Luffy fight, to me, it felt like it was going to be cooler than it really was. It wasn't bad, but it was no Luffy versus Zoro or Luffy versus Usopp. No, it wasn't on that level. It was much more pulled back, much more subdued, I think. And it, like I said, it wasn't terrible. I didn't mind it, but I, I was expecting more now that Sanji was going to finally fight against Luffy. But what it basically ends with is Luffy is not going to fight back against Sanji, He and he refuses to eat anyone's cooking but Sanji's and wants Sanji to come back with him. Sanji gets back in the carriage, rides off. Luffy insists, and this is important, that he will wait in that exact spot and refuses to leave 
until Sanji comes back and agrees to rejoin the crew. And he will only eat Sanji's food, which is like a big plot point for the next 15 chapters. So Sanji rides off. The army of Big Mom arrives. They capture Luffy and Nami and dragged them off. Luffy's fighting against the army under the argument of, I, I have to stay here. I told him I would stay here. I can't leave. The army eventually beats Luffy, who has now been beaten down by Master Cracker. He has now been beaten down by Sanji. He is just tore up. He is on the ground. And I, I loved the commitment and the dedication from Luffy in this, this area. It's something that he's done repeatedly, going all the way back to VV and everyone else. When he gets involved, he refuses to do anything that he only he will only do what he said he's going to do. That's it. If he tells you he's going to wait there for you, he's going to wait there for you. That is what he's going to do. And I love that he's stuck to that. And he's arguing with these guys, not to fight against them, not to fight against Big Mom, but because he told Sanji that he would be here. He would be waiting for Sanji in this spot. We move forward. Sanji is still pretty beat up from everything that has gone on between his brothers and the fights and all that other stuff. He explains everything to Pudding. Pudding and him kind of come to what appear at this point in the story, what appears to be like terms where they're just going to try to make the best of this. Uh, we find out that Pudding is basically just like a weapon that Big Mom uses to for political marriages, and this is what she's going to do, and all this kinds of stuff. Like that, that this is she looks at the marriages as a political weapon. That's what Big Mom does with Pudding. We find all of this out, but Sanji and Pudding agree to kind of make the best of this situation. We then cut away to Chopper being captured. I'm not 100% sure where Chopper got captured, and it's mostly because I didn't write the note for it. Um, I remember Chopper got away from the original battle he was in and went into the mirror world. And then now in my head, looking at my note, Chopper is captured. So I, I'm not 100% sure what note I forgot to write down for that one. But Chopper has a plan. Basically, he can change forms and they tied him up big. So he's going to go small to get away. And they're going to eat carrot. I'm just going to mention this part because it comes up a little bit later. I loved the reveal that carrot's going to be turned into stew. A little bit later, it's revealed that it's not carrot. Brulee turned a frog into a carrot looking thing and carrots above the suspended frog version of carrot calling out so that they're confused that if it's actually carrot or not. That was a fun thing. I enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> um, we also discover at this point in the storyline, uh, what I thought was kind of cool, but it also seemed like almost like horror levels to me. We discover that Big Mom has a book, and the book is pages, and you can, and she's got someone with a with a devil fruit that can take people, put them in the book pages as a prison. But then they reveal that the people in the book are there, stuck forever, and they're fully alive and fully conscious. And I'm I'm reading this, and I'm just picturing like that has literally got to be hell, like almost like. It kind of reminds me of like a black mirror situation where like your consciousness gets downloaded into a robot and then you're just stuck being conscious of everything for the rest of eternity because they don't age and they don't need food and they don't need water, but they're conscious what's going on in this book prison. And I'm like, that is, that is terrible. You're just putting people in a book for a collection, human beings, animals, everything. And they're just there. For all eternity, and they cannot age, and they're not hungry, and they're not thirsty, and they can't move, but they're fully conscious in this book prison. I was like, that is that is like nightmare fuel for me right there. To be like, I can't imagine just being like bound forever, forever, beyond my natural lifespan, and you're just thinking about it. Like, I get it's the same kind of nightmare fuel I get when someone's like, we we it, not someone, it doesn't actually happen. It's it's a false thing. But, you know, in stories about vampires where they're like, we're going to put you in a coffin and drop you at the bottom of the ocean. And maybe someday someone will find you. Who knows? And I'm like, that's nightmare fuel for me. Seriously. The, you, you guys are watching these videos. I have ADD and had a crazy amount of energy. Could you imagine me just being like in that book? Like, oh, please let me go, big mom. Ah! I would go insane. I would, I would, I would turn into like. I would go find the most evil devil uh, devil fruit. I would eat it, and I would go like on a rampage, killing everyone. That's what would happen if you put me in a book like that. Moving forward, we discover that the big thing is the Taimat or Teamot. I want to say Taimate, Taimate chest. So going all the way back to Fishman Island, it turns out that when Luffy was like, take all the treasure in payment for all the food I ate, in that was the Taimat or the T... It's a, an important chest with some kind of like ancient weapon or something in it like that. Uh, Big Mom reveals that she actually wasn't too upset with Luffy because she got that chest out of his 
arrangement. And that chest is what is important to her because that chest is going to do something. But the chest is what she got out of the deal. And she's offering to let Luffy and Nami go if they promise not to mess with anything. And she's okay with everything because she got the chest. We do discover later that it's an obvious trick and she was never going to let them go. I didn't assume that she was going to at this moment either. I feel like when Oda was writing this portion, he was trying to come across like, well, Big Mom's not really a bad guy, but we've already set up that Big Mom is a bad guy. So I'm not sure what they were, what he was trying to do with these particular moments and this like attitude of Big Mom being like, hey, if Sanji disagrees, everyone can go and I don't care and you're all fine and you're all going to be okay. I don't know if that was an attempt at making Big Mom, Big Mom not seem quite as evil. Or if that was just how he was writing the scenes, I'm not sure. I kind of got a vibe that he was trying to make us like, well, Big Mom's not all bad. Look, she's going to marry off Pudding, and Pudding's a nice girl, and Sanji's going to be happy, even though it's not really what he wants. And She's going to let the straw hats go, and I don't know. But I, I knew Big Mom was a bad guy. At no point was I confused by that. <laughs> uh, we also discovered that Lola, the reason why Big Mom hates Lola, because they show up and they're talking to Nami, not, and they want to know where Lola is. Turns out Lola running away ruined one of those political marriages in which Lola was going to basically get Big Mom to become like queen of the pirates, I guess, or king of the pirates. I'm not sure if they use the gender in the name or if it's just king. But either way, Big Mom was going to be king of the pirates. And we also discovered that Pudding's life is basically controlled by Big Mom because Pudding's life is the new person, basically the new Lola to help Big Mom with these political marriages and stuff like that. Again, we're, we're building up that this like poor pitiful pudding moment. Like pudding is just, she's so sad and her life is terrible and she's being pushed around by big mom. And what are we going to do about that? And it's going to be really, really sad. It really, really is. And I, I was starting to feel it. I was starting to feel it. Meanwhile, during all of this, Soul King, AKA Brooke, AKA the best skeleton ever is working with Pedro, a cat man with a turban, I think. Uh, he's he's showed up in the previous arc. So I know who Pedro is, um, but he showed up in the previous arcs. And they're working on fighting everything in the background because they're trying to get their hands on a stone rubbing of the pond glyph uh, that Big Mom owns and Big Mom guards. This is her pond glyph to get her to uh, the end of the line, uh, end of the red line. Wow, what's the name of that? I didn't write down the name of the island, but they've named the island that they're all trying to get to. It starts with an R. But at this point, the story is now Pedro and Brooke are doing this. Chopper and Carrot are doing this. Nami and Luffy are captured. And Pudding finds them in the book prison. And she goes to Luffy and says that she's going to fix all of this and whispers something. And then Luffy's eyes go bugged out. He's all like, what the hell What the hell did you say? She turns around and she's got tears in her eyes. And she says that she's going to fix this. Now, my assumption at this moment was that we were going for a standard Oda sad play. And I was all in for the sad play. I really was. I was like, oh my God, Pudding's going to commit suicide or something along those lines, some form of self-harm, or she's going to try it. That's That was where my head went. Like, oh, I like I don't know much about Pudding, but she's so sweet and, pit and she's so sweet and sad and I just want her to be happy. And now she's going to do this because she thinks it's going to fix everything for everyone. And the story builds up to that. Sanji being sad about his situation, but accepting the fact that he's going to be with Pudding. He goes and he makes a big meal for her. And it's like, oh my God, I made too much food. What am I going to do? I should bring this food to her and make her happy. And then we get multiple panels of him walking, debating how happy his life is going to be with Pudding. And I'm like, you're setting up the set. He's going to walk in on something. He's I'm like, this is going to be terrible. He's going to walk in on something with Pudding and it's going to be sad and he's going to be sad and he's going to finally realize that he needs to stop everything because everything Big Mom did made Pudding go in this direction and I was getting really worked up. I was really sad. Only for the reveal, Pudding is not some sad, pitiful woman that needs to be saved by Sanji. She has her own powers of a third eye which lets her... I'm not 100% sure because I have, I mean, the reveal, and then we have like four chapters. I'm not 100% sure what the third eye does at the moment, but she has a third eye. She's truly evil. She orchestrated this whole thing. The plan is to kill Sanji, Sanji's sister, his father, the brothers, everybody, kill the entire kingdom on the day of the wedding. This is all being orchestrated by her and Big Mom. And I'm like, oh, what a good reveal! That's so much better than like doing another sad pull of the rug. I like this. Pudding's evil. This is great. And she's doing this, telling 
Sanji's sister, who she shot in the leg, the whole plot while Sanji's eavesdropping. And I'm like, this is awesome because Sanji's going to know everything and his sister's going to know everything. And then what's going to happen? Only to discover Pudding has a devil fruit that allows her to take out people's memories and remove segments. And I'm like, this story is getting so good because now only Sanji knows about this. As a matter of fact, I even wrote in my notes here in caps, WTF, she's evil? She's going to murder all the Vin Smokes? <laughs> that was my note. For those of you who might be new to this channel, these notes are to myself. No one reads them but me. That was my note to myself. Like I was questioning myself. <laughs> so I loved that reveal. And then I loved the better part about it. We discover more about Sanji's history and all this stuff involving him where he goes he basically goes in on his sister afterwards after her memory's been altered. He explains everything that's going on and basically tells her the truth. The sister's like, I guess it kind of makes sense. And he's like, yeah, look at those gaps in your memory. That's where all of this got pulled out. So it all lines up and it makes sense to her. And she then reveals why Sanji is the way he is. And it was so sweet and it was nice. And it just, it buttoned up the Sanji origin story that we already had, where we basically discover that the mother didn't like what the father was going to do trying to make these super soldiers, the Vin Smoke super soldiers, or I can't, Genra, Gen, what, what's the name? It, it, either way, the, the army that he's going to be. And so she was taking a medicine to try and counter what they were doing, but it only affected Sanji. He's the only one who managed to have his emotions and not be a super soldier. The brothers all have no emotions and no empathy. They're all what's considered super soldiers now. And the sister seemingly is like half and half from what, I don't think they fully revealed what her situation is, but she does care about Sanji, but she also doesn't care or have, I think she has empathy, but no emotions. She has something, something is half with her. So that, I love that reveal. I love what's going on. And then the sister basically telling Sanji to just leave. She swapped out the bracelets. They're not going to blow his hands up. Just leave. Let all the Vin Smokes die. Let this happen as intended. And it's over. All of this will be over and Sanji can go beat the Straw Hats, but he's too nice of a guy. He can't let that happen. He still has to try and save them, which also adds to Sanji's character, which is awesome. While this is going on, we have Luffy literally trying to tear his arms off so that he doesn't get stuck in the book forever, um, which is a very Luffy thing to do. Um, but he gets saved by the one, the only, Jimbei. This is when we discover that Jimbei's situation that he needed to resolve after Fishman Island was this. But now he's do staging a mutiny, basically, and he's helping everyone out. They get free from the prison. They run off. Sanji's explained everything to the sister, and they're looking for each other. Yeah, I, I'm not, I didn't write who he went to, but he went to someone to reveal the plot that Pudding had told him. I think it was Sanji's sister. I might be wrong about that. It doesn't really matter because what happens is Luffy shows up, tells somebody the plot that Pudding had told him because he told Pudding told him everything just to get the shock in his face and then walk away from him. And he goes to this person. I think it was the sister. Tells them what's going on. It doesn't matter who it is because he that they go, we already know. We were here a part of it. And he goes, okay, cool. And he just runs away. He doesn't hang out. He doesn't talk to the person. He's out, jumps out a window to go wait in the spot. He told Sanji he would wait. And he sits there and he does nothing. While this is going on, they managed to recover Brooke, who for some reason, I don't know what I missed, but Big Mom decided to treat him like a doll and was sleeping with him cuddled up. Uh, they get him free after a couple of failed attempts, which was kind of funny, and discover that Brooke managed to get the pond glyph rubbings and store them in his skull that was a great like oh he did it great reveal and then we have sanji realizes the food he made was the food that everyone on the straw hats loved he made all their meals and he's gonna go tell luffy everything so that luffy and nami can leave so he goes to the spot that luffy is waiting for him and we find luffy drained of life practically looks like a skeleton Sanji gives him the meals. It says it's waterlogged. I dropped it. It's ruined. And, and Luffy's just like, whatever. It's amazing. And finally, Sanji explains everything. He tells Luffy what's going on. And he tells Luffy that he has to leave because Sanji needs to save everyone. Sanji has to save his family. He has to save uh, all the people for, I, I don't think he wants to save pudding and all them, but he has to save his family and make sure this doesn't happen. And Luffy smacks the crap out of him and is like, just tell me what you want. Just tell me. And it reminded me of the scene with Vivi. It reminded me of the scene with Robin. It reminded me of the scene. Like every time he does this, just tell me what you want. 
And Sanji's like, I just want to go back to the Sunny. And that's it. That's Luffy's like, let's do it. We're going. We're going to fix this. And I'm like, yes. My PlayStation just updated. Yes. This is what I wanted. This is great. Now we're on the track to go stop the wedding or fight against Pudding or fight against Big Mom. I don't know. I think there's like 40 something chapters left in this arc and I'm excited for it. I am. Because this is exactly where I wanted it to go. Now, I was I wrote a note here and I wanted to say this whole cake island arc feels weirdly more coherent, which is than the previous arc of Dress Rosa. And I find that to be a bit weird because Dress Rosa had the whole most of the crew there for most of the story before they separated. While this one doesn't have the whole crew, we have Brooke, uh, Luffy, Sanji, Nami, Chopper of the main main crew. Then we got Pedro and Carrot on board as well. I think the reason why this feels more coherent and more like linear, I guess you would say, instead of being all over the place, is Dress Rosa tried really hard to make us care about what was going to become Luffy's fleet. So we were getting introduced to a ton of characters that we had no idea if any of them were important in any way, shape, or form. And for some reason, Whole Cake Island just feels more compacted, even though I know it's one of the bigger arcs. It just feels like... He really nailed in how he wants to tell the story. We're not traveling too far from the Straw Hats. They're always There's always one of them involved in what's happening around here right now. And I really like that. I really am liking Whole Kick Island in comparison to Dress Rosa. Not to say Dress Rosa was a bad story, but this is just a lot better and it's getting me more excited for what's going on. So that's my opinions on chapters 842 to 857. If you guys enjoy these shorter chapters where I can actually write more notes and kind of be more on point, let me know in the comments down below. We're still trying this shorter chapter gap. If you're wondering, the whole reason is simple. I want to be able to do other videos here. We just finished up our Berserk video. Dan and I are still working on the podcast, Dub Degenerates. I'm reading a bunch of other random manga. I found another one from the Chainsaw Guy, so Chainsaw Man Guy, so we're going to put that up real soon. But I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you next time right here at Manga Story.